Well, hello again, uh, students at Spring Lake Village. It's Nick again. I hope you're doing well this Friday, the 20th of August. And we're going to be uh, wrapping up our four-part series on the British Raj. Today's lecture is entitled British India and the Indian Mutiny of 1857. So last week, um, we discussed how both the uh, British and East Indian companies continued to expand their um, commercial enterprises in the uh, subcontinent of India. Uh, the British had, of course, their trading posts at Madras here and also in uh, Calcutta. And the major uh, trading post of the French was here at uh, Pondicherry, located some 85 miles south of uh, Madras. So their cordial relations eventually became much more aggressive in their pursuit of uh, more territory and the establishment of uh, trading posts. And conflict would ensue against the backdrop of continental wars, namely the War of the Austrian Succession, which began uh, in 1740. And in North America, the famous French and Indian War, which ensued in 1754 between British America's colonies and New France. This would lead to open conflict on the subcontinent between these two great powers. And the conflict was situated um, here in the uh, southeast along the so-called Carnatic region, also known as the Coromandel uh, Coast, beginning in 1746, when the French um, attacked the British trading post at uh, Madras. And then two years later, the British would attack the French stronghold of uh, Pondicherry. In that same year, 1748, uh, a treaty was negotiated in which um, both uh, posts were returned to the respective countries. And during um, the Carnatic Wars, two figures would emerge, each of whom would symbolize the imperialistic ambitions of the French and British respectively. The imperialistic dreamer of the French was Joseph Francois Duplex, a wily individual with great charm, great charisma, um, who had superb diplomatic skills. He had come to understand uh, Indian culture, immersed himself in Indian culture. Uh, he understood the territorial ambitions of the various um, princely Hindu states that were emerging in the wake of the crumbling uh, Mughal Empire. And he learned how to play each of these princely states off of one another in the pursuit of France's territorial uh, ambitions. Eventually, um, he would uh, fail in his pursuit and return to France in ignominy and die a broken uh, man. The great uh, figure for the British was the company colonel Robert Clive, who would earn his reputation at the famous Battle of Plassey in June of 1757, in which his company of 3,000 troops would defeat the forces of the Nawab of Bengal, some 50,000 uh, strong. It was a predetermined battle. In many ways, it was a skirmish, but it remains uh, one of the most important events in the history of the East India Company and in the history of the British Empire, because in that year, the East India Company ceased to be a conventional corporation. It would transform itself into an aggressive colonial entity and begin the rapid expansion now of British territorial uh, ambitions at the expense of the French.
the conquest of Bengal now is a watershed moment. Uh, the EIC would be granted the so-called Diwani of Bengal, control over the administration of the region and the right to collect tax revenue from some 10 million Bengalis. The word loot, um, a Sanskrit word would now enter into the English language to symbolize the pillage of this incredibly wealthy region. Robert Clive would return in triumph to England, an immensely uh, wealthy man, as would other uh, officials of the, uh, East in, in, of the East British Company. Um, but in the process, um, it impoverished the region of uh, Bengal. Some seven million Bengalis also would die of starvation as a result of famine, the deprivation of this once great uh, wealthy region um, being uh, exploited of its many raw materials, uh, etc. So again, um, by the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century, many of the officials of the East India Company returned to England immensely wealthy. Uh, they bought up huge tracts of land, uh, built stately homes and became uh, envied by many of their counterparts, uh, many uh, of their uh, peers um, looked upon them as these sort of filthy rich uh, sort of robber barons. They were given uh, the derogatory title of nabobs, which is how the British pronounced uh, the princely title Nawab, like the famous Nawabs of Bengal. You're probably also familiar with uh, Nob Hill in San Francisco, uh, the famous Nabobs or Nobs of San Francisco, sort of a derogatory term for um, the early San Franciscan titans who uh, built stately homes on uh, Knob Hill. We're all familiar uh, with Knob Hill. So uh, many officials back in England were extremely um, angered at how the East India Company was administrating uh, Bengal and also they were quite uh, taken aback by these huge fortunes that were being realized uh, at the expense of the Bengalis. Really, Bengal had become a colony of exploitation. There was enormous corruption and uh, mismanagement among officials. And the one governor general um, who had been appointed, Warren Hastings, typified the corruption and graft taking place uh, in Bengal. In 1788, um, Warren Hastings, the governor general of Bengal, here you see him right here, would be called back to England where he would be impeached. And the prosecution was led by the famous MP Edmund Burke, a famous Irish statesman and philosopher who was very much disturbed by what was taking place uh, in Bengal. At that trial, um, the question would emerge, did England want to become a corrupt colonial power, subjugating some 200 million people, uh, raping and exploiting this once uh, wealthy region? Or did it want to be a beneficent uh, suzerain who would respect the rights of those it was uh, colonizing? This became a, a very important debate, an ongoing um, debate um, of how Britain would continue to rule in India. Eventually, uh, Parliament would 
appoint, appoint a new governor general of Bengal, the reform-minded Lord Charles Carnwallis, whom we're all very familiar with. Of course, he was the uh, British general who surrendered to George Washington at, uh, at the, in 1781 at Yorktown. Uh, but he would emerge as a very uh, reform-minded governor general who would bring about sweeping changes um, in Bengal and the way it was uh, managed by the East India Company. A subsequent governor general um, who began his administration in 1798 was Richard Wellesley, brother of the famous uh, Duke of Wellington. And um, he would be very instrumental in extending company rule in India. And he would order the invasion and the eventual uh, annexation of the princely state of Mysore in 1799. Here's a map of uh, India showing various uh, territories controlled by the British. These are the lands of the Marathas in the uh, Deccan region. Here, of course, is uh, Bengal, uh, Calcutta. And in 1799, the East India Company would invade uh, this region of Mysore in uh, southern India. So the kingdom of Mysore was ruled by a legendary figure by the name of Tipu Sultan. No one in the 18th century made the hearts of the English lions quake with fear as much as Tipu Sultan, the famous tiger of Mysore. Tipu Sultan and his father, Hader Ali, would bring the East India Company nearer to ruin than any other Indian foes had brought it hitherto. For some 40 years, uh, Tipu Sultan and his father had halted the triumphant march of the British through southern India, refusing to make their peace with these foreign invaders. In British chronicles, Tipu was seen as an agent of darkness, a satanic figure, a demon who would bring about uh, the ruin ruinization of the Indian subcontinent. But in Indian chronicles, he was seen as a restless modernizer, a great uh, reformer. And he embraced many um, Western principles, including uh, new military methods in the area of artillery and rockets. Um, he reorganized his army, um, whereas the British identified him as a religious bigot who brutalized and forcibly converted Hindus and Christians under his rule. His own subjects saw him as um, a great uh, promoter of religion and uh, a great champion of the Islamic faith, but not at the expense of other sects. There are a number of uh, stories regarding this um, title, Tiger of Mysore. Some claim he fought a tiger to the death and was victorious. Um, but we, he obviously had a reverence for tigers. Um, lots of iconography in his palace at Seringapatam, which is located uh, some 200 miles west of the British trading post of Madras. We know his throne was um, shaped like a, a tiger, um, et cetera, but he fashioned himself as this uh, fearsome creature, uh, the tiger. And he saw himself as the one liberator, the champion of liberty against those 
oppressors of the human race, uh, the British. So again, um, there were a number of battles uh, that he fought against uh, the British that eventually ended in 1799, as I mentioned, with the annexation. Um, he died uh, a hero to the death um, at Saragapatam uh, in May of 1799, thus ending the Mysore Wars. Uh, Tipu's legacy has become a subject of polemics and a tool in the hands of opposing sides in debate about the historical nature of Hindu and Muslim relations uh, in India. Today, uh, most people in India see him as the great resistor against imperialistic rule, as somebody who embraced uh, the sovereignty of his people and a great champion of uh, freedom, uh, etc. Here's a painting, I think it's located uh, in the Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, but it shows the heroic death of Tipu at his last stand of Syringapatam in uh, 1799. And this is um, headgear worn by the uh, tiger of Mysore, which uh, is now to be found in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So by 1818, the East India Company would become the greatest political power in the Indian subcontinent. It would have control over two-thirds of India's landmass, eventually ruling over 200 million people. But as we discussed um, a moment ago, the India question um, was center stage uh, already in the last quarter of the 18th century, the ongoing debate of how the East India Company was ruling uh, over India. And a series of acts were initiated that would curtail and control the uh, power of the East India Company. This including, included the Regulatory Act of 1773 and the Charter Act or India Act of uh, 1784, which would permit Parliament to better supervise the uh, administration of India under the East India Company and curtail uh, a lot of its heavy-handed uh, activities. And we mentioned how um, Lord Charles Cornwallis um, was the leading uh, reformer uh, at, when he was governor uh, general of uh, the East India Company. So, um, Cornwallis's reforms in many ways would um, set the stage for uh, better governance uh, at, by the uh, East India Company in an, an attempt to uh, reshape its uh, public image uh, back in England, uh, its uh, system of collecting taxes would be overhauled, the Diwani system, as I mentioned uh, earlier, would be uh, overhauled, making it much more um, efficient uh, in the way it collected taxes. Nonetheless, it was still realizing um, enormous um, revenues, uh, et cetera. Hastings was eventually acquitted, but again, as I mentioned, Parliament saw to it um, that reforms would be enacted under a General Cornwallis. Now, a turning point in the history of the East India Company took place in 1830 with uh, the passing of the Charter Act of that year, which effectively ended the EIC's trade monopoly, except uh, in China. And some 20 years later, the India Act of 1833 would put an end effectively to 
the East India Company's trading business and transform it essentially into a managing agency for the British government in India, essentially making it the de facto government uh, in India. So the East India Company really wanted to reshape and reimagine uh, its the view that people had of the East India Company transform itself into more uh, benevolent and legitimate suzerain over Indian society. During the uh, early 19th century, uh, we see the anglicizing of the Indians of the subcontinent. Um, the British saw themselves as sort of missionaries who would bring uh, a new era in India by sort of reshaping, refashioning the Indian people in their own image. Uh, many of the uh, English ethnocentric uh, attitudes and viewpoints would uh, manifest themselves in the way they treated uh, Indian uh, culture. Uh, and so the British saw themselves as sort of champions of civilization who would illumine and enlighten the peoples of the subcontinent, both uh, Muslims and Hindus, as well as Sikhs, uh, et cetera, uh, in their effort to anglicize the uh, locals. So we find, for example, one uh, official of the EIC uh, making the pronouncement, a single shelf of a good European library was worth a whole native literature of India and Arabia. As one might expect, um, the locals found many of these attitudes altogether uh, reprehensible in the way uh, the British viewed uh, the Indian people. In 1813, Parliament packed the so-called Regulatory Act, which permitted uh, English missionaries to proselytize in uh, India, attempt to convert Muslims and Hindus who felt very threatened by this proselytizing. We find in 1837, uh, English becomes the official language of the Indian government and uh, Bible classes are now being um, introduced into uh, various colleges uh, and schools. The uh, officials of the East India Company were really trying to uh, upend centuries of Hindu and Muslim uh, practices, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, probably one of the most egregious attempts to uh, overturn centuries old cultural institution was the so-called Widow Remarriage Act of uh, 1856. So for centuries, um, to protect what it considered family honor and family property, upper caste Hindu society had long disallowed the remarriage of widows, even child and adolescent ones, all of whom were expected to live a life of austerity. But the new law enacted in 1856 would do away with this long-standing long -standing, uh, custom. The new legislation would permit and even encourage widows to remarry. Again, this was seen as a direct affront to this long-standing Hindu tradition of remaining uh, single after uh, one was widowed. Many Indians, including the sepoys, felt that their cu culture now was under siege. So during the early decades of the 19th century, uh, the East India Company would expand its territorial acquisitions um, over the Indian uh, subcontinent. So there were at the time some 650 uh, princely states. And 
historically, uh, when a prince died, he was, and so according to Hindu law, when a ruler without natural heirs uh, died uh, without having uh, one of his own progeny, uh, he was allowed to adopt a person who would have all the personal and political rights of a son. The new uh, governor general of the East India Company, uh, James Ramsey, Ramsey uh, or Lord Dallasy, began to uh, enact a new policy called the Doctrine of Lapse. Lord Dallasy um, asserted the doctrine of paramountcy by which Great Britain, as the ruling power of the Indian subcontinent, claimed its superintendency over the subordinate uh, princely states of India. He also utilized the so-called doctrine of lapse that had already been in place since uh, 1804, and this policy would eventually annex over 30 uh, princely states in India. So under the uh, doctrine of lapse, if a ruler died without an heir, or if he himself was incompetent, uh, the British had the right to veto the succession of an adopted heir. Uh, this meant that in, they could even reject last minute adoptions and immediately annex uh, one of these princely territories. The adopted successors were permitted to retain their titles and even given uh, a generous um, stipend. But as I mentioned, uh, between 1804 and 1855, over 30 states were annexed in this way. And this, um, this uh, attempt to gain more territory would enrage the uh, Indian population and help bring about the famous Indian Mutiny of 1857. So among the um, states that would be annexed were uh, Satara in 1848, Jaipur in 1849, Sambalpur in 1850, Udaipur, uh, etc. These were uh, just a few of the some 30 or so uh, princely states that were annexed. And during the uh, rule of Lord Dallasy, the uh, Sikh kingdom of the Punjab was annexed, not using the doctrine of lapse, but it was a, a military enterprise uh, bringing an end to the uh, famous Anglo-Sikh wars in uh, April of 1849. This um, region would be incorporated into uh, British uh, India. The English, recognizing the uh, cultural diversity of the Punjab, would maintain a strict policy of non-interference in regard to religious and cultural matters. Sikh aristocrats would be given patronage and pensions um, to control their historical uh, places of worship and were allowed effectively to remain in control. And this region, the Punjab region, um, would be an ally uh, during the uh, Indian uprising of 1857. And as I mentioned, um, the policy of the doctrine of lapse uh, in no small way led to the uh, Sepoy uprising of uh, 1857. So um, I tried to find some maps to give you an idea where uh, some of these princely states that were annexed under the uh, doctrine of lapse are located. So here's Udaipur, Jaipur, Sitara is located uh, here. Uh, 
um, in the Western Bengal region is uh, Sambalpur. Sambalpur is located here. We have uh, Nagpur, etc. And there were, as I mentioned, several other princely states um, that were annexed as well. So the famous Sepoy Mutiny, also known as the Great Revolt, or the First War of Indian Independence, began in May of 1857, so exactly 100 years before India would achieve uh, independence. And it really is the watershed in the history of pre-independent and early um, colonial uh, India. So the mutiny um, took place mostly among Islamic units from Bengal who uh, rose up in mutiny in Mirut, which is located some 50 miles uh, northeast of uh, Delhi. So the sepoys, of course, were uh, recruited from primarily the Muslim and Hindu population. Uh, many were in the service of the East India Company as bureaucrats, but they were most famous and mostly recruited uh, to serve as auxiliary troops. Um, so by the middle of the uh, 19th century, there were uh, about 225,000 uh, locals who served as uh, soldiers in this sepoy army and about 46,000 um, who were British. Um, but there was, of course, a hierarchy. Um, the sepoys uh, were rarely allowed to advance. Um, they represented the lower ranking uh, soldiers of the East India Company Army, whereas the British represented the uh, upper echelon. This, of course, um, led to uh, great hostility. There were uh, other reasons as well for the uh, uprising, as we discuss um, the efforts on the part of the British to transform Indian society, which was seen as a real threat to century-long uh, traditions, um, just um, obliterating you know, these ancient traditions and rituals. Also, um, the uh, way of farming, etc., system of uh, taxation, these are some of the more uh, economic reasons. Uh, and as I mentioned, the social religious uh, region, reasons as well, trying to uh, convert uh, Muslims and Hindus to uh, convert to Christianity were seen as a front, an affront to in Indian culture. But what really um, sparked the mutiny in May of 1857 was when uh, new rifles were issued to the sepoys, new rifles called the Enfield uh, Rifles. Now, these rifles used uh, paper uh, cartridges that were uh, sealed with wax, uh, mainly beeswax, but a rumor arose among the ranks of the sepoys that in fact, um, the wax that was being used was either pig wax or wax derived from beef from cows. Uh, and as you know, um, for Muslims, um, pork was uh, anathema, it was forbidden. And uh, for Hindus, uh, cows were worshipped, uh, were revered. So anything uh, derived from beef, beef was considered um, forbidden. So there's been an ongoing debate about whether or not the uh, army, the British army, deliberately uh, used either pork or beef wax to um, seal the paper cartridges. Again, much discussion. Uh, I think, in fact, probably not because the British were well aware of the uh, Hindu and Muslim sensibilities, but nonetheless, um, uh, 
the rumors stuck and supposedly an untouchable arsenal uh, worker refused um, a drink by a higher caste sepoy uh, soldier. And this rumor spread throughout the ranks of the uh, sepoy army. So the sepoys refused to use the uh, Enfield rifles and the British commanders came out, punished them severely. Many were uh, beaten relentlessly, thrown into prisons, et cetera. And so this, more than anything else, um, sparked this very bloody engagement. So the mutiny um, erupted when some 85 sepoys were jailed in Mirat, again, uh, near Delhi. Mirat is located near Delhi. <clears throat> for refusing um, to use these grease cartridges. Then an Indian mob began rioting at a Mirat brothel, and they stormed the prison and released the prisoners. Three sepoy regiments uh, then mutinied. They went on a rage, killing any British or other Europeans they could find. The mutineers then moved on to Delhi and captured uh, the city. Now, um, most of the uprising took place here in Northern India, north of Delhi in the territory called the uh, Oud. So the mutiny uh, began uh, to spread like a wildfire and the mutineers, um, although they were sort of a motley, uh, group um, not under the control of one commander gained the upper hand, and this um, altogether terrified uh, the army of the British East India Company, uh, and they temporarily were without reinforcements. It was an extremely bloody um, uprising um, that took place. It was an extremely bloody engagement, uh, and both sides were guilty of horrific uh, crimes. Uh, two of the uh, most egregious battles took place um, in Kampir or Kampur, which was a British uh, fortress located in uh, Uttar Pradesh, in this region here. Um, in which the entire garrison, uh, including 200 British women and children, had to surrender. Now, initially, um, the sepoy rebels promised they would not do harm to the women and children, but eventually they were hacked to death at a place of encampment called Bibagar. In retaliation, um, the British forces um, slaughtered every sepoy um, they encountered, and um, they also staged a, a mass uh, hanging. Eventually, um, Britain would have to bring in forces from uh, Persia, China, and Burma, the famed Gurkha forces, in order to serve as auxiliaries um, to quell the uh, Sepoy uprising. The British and its reinforcements were successful in retaking Delhi. Uh, and look now, one of the most bloodiest engagements um, in which some 4,000 British and Indian troops withstood and onslaught of well over 10,000 uh, sepoy mutineers. This was a horrific uh, engagement and would go down in the annals of British history as one of the most valiant efforts on uh, the part of the East India Army. But in the end, um, the East India Company Army was triumphant and uh, they were absolutely merciless 
uh, in their punishment of the mutineers, thousands of them uh, were executed. There's a map uh, here showing the uh, Oud region, O-U-D-H. So this is this was the major uh, theater of war of the uh, five-month-long uh, Indian uprising. So the siege of Lucknow, Kampur is located, I think, a little south of here. This is where um, the theater of operation uh, took place. So this event uh, that took place in 1857, again, 100 years before India would uh, realize its independence is one of the most important events um, in the history of India and certainly for the uh, East India Company. Um, many books would be written about the bravery of the British soldiers at the expense of the uh, mutineers. Uh, these would inspire a generation of uh, young Victorians, um, etc. Um, this marked a turning point, as I mentioned, in the history of the East India Company, because now the British crown would assume control over the subcontinent. And this, of course, marks uh, the beginning of the true British Raj in India that would last for uh, the next 100 years as the British crown presided over the destinies of more than 215 million people, determining their economic, social, and political uh, life. English efforts to reshape Indian society would uh, come to an end. Uh, the British officials would become much more insular and remain in their can cantonments and um, effectively carry on a totally British way of life, um, rarely interacting uh, with the Indian population. Attempts at conversion to Christianity uh, would come to an end. The uh, 1857 mutiny and the establishment of the British Raj uh, a year later in 1858 would mark the formal end of the Mughal Empire with the exile of the last Mughal emperor to Burma, one Bahadur Shah. Uh, parliament effectively abolished the British East India Company, and now the British crown would rule over its jewel in the crown. Queen Victoria saw herself now as the Empress of India. Her new title, another title, added to um, her regal, regal, regal majesty, etc. There was even a special crown uh, as Empress of India, this uh, small crown that you see her uh, wearing. She saw herself happily ruling over uh, the Indian uh, people. Um, Indian culture uh, was still uh, respected, but again, uh, this bureaucratic uh, rule would over time uh, undermine and sort of so again, um, British attitudes towards the people of India would shift from a kind of relative openness. So early on in the history of the East India Company, we saw how many EIC officials were very much enamored by all things Indian. Many took uh, Indian wives uh, and returned to India with them. Um, they took on many of the trappings and uh, customs of the uh, Hindu people in uh, particular. But we see a shift from relative openness to insularity and 
outright xenophobia, even against those with a comparable background and achievement, as well as loyalty to the British. As I mentioned, um, the British lived in cantonments at a distance from uh, Indian settlements. So this period of the, during the British Raj, we see the rise of private clubs where the British gathered for social interaction between symbols of exclusivity and snobbery that refused to disappear decades after the British would uh, leave India. The Hindu intelligentsia would learn a valuable political lesson from the great uprising of 1857. The effectiveness of a well-orchestrated agitation um, would now hereafter be utilized uh, demonstration in the streets, um, the use of media, the use of the legal system to redress many of the grievances the Indian people had uh, against um, British rule in India and would go on to serve as a model, as an inspiration for uh, subsequent uh, uprisings and independence movements um, throughout uh, former uh, colonial territories. So um, I hope that gave you a, a good overview of British rule going all the way back to the early 17th century up until official British rule, the official British Raj beginning um, in 1858. Next week, um, we're gonna begin another uh, series of lectures that I think will be um, very enjoyable and entertaining when we um, explore the lives of four remarkable uh, females, um, British trailblazers, um, legendary um, explorers. I, I think you'll enjoy um, this new lecture series uh, for September. So um, I hope you all have a great week and um, I do look forward to seeing you next